Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chad Dowding, and I'm the program director for the Howenstein Center's Cook Leadership Academy. I first want to thank you for joining us for the final session of our Women in Leadership First Conference of U.S. Women Governors. And we end our day together. We wanted to focus on the incredible, authentic conversations up close with our local, on the local level to focus on women leaders in West Michigan. Over the past several years, we have invited community leaders to our campus to share their personal experiences and leadership perspectives through our Wheelhouse Talk series. Our goal has always been to make leaders and their leadership perspectives accessible to our students and our community with the hope that we can learn and grow from those making an impact today. As you might already know, our talks highlight the contributions and experiences of leaders from a variety of disciplines, communities, and cultures. These leaders take center stage and share their personal narratives and lessons learned. For the rest of us, the Wheelhouse Talks are a space for reflection, a celebration of human endeavors, and an activation of the potential within us all. This evening, I would be remiss if I did not take a moment to acknowledge that as a man and as a feminist, I am deeply indebted and to the incredible women in my life. To them, thank you. Thank you for enshrining the moral principle of women's equality in my conscience and fostering my engagement in the struggle to confront the challenges women face today. Indeed, in my mind today, more than ever, it is vital that all our CLA fellows, especially our men, take an opportunity to hear from, reflect on, and ultimately commit to empowering the women leaders, current and future, in their lives. One logistical note before I get into our introductions. All of our CLA fellows, please keep in mind that we'll be asking you to ask questions at the end of the session. So during the talk, please uh, consider your questions and come up to the mics once we get to the question and answer period. Now on to the introductions. Birgit Close is the president and CEO of The Right Place Incorporated, a position she has held since 1987. The Right Place is the regional economic development organization in Grand Rapids. Under her leadership, The Right Place has created or retained more than 44,000 jobs and spurred more than $4.7 billion in new investment. She is a leading economic development strategist, collaborating with local, state, and national organizations on critical issues related to economic development. A native of Germany and a leading authority in international business and economic development, Close also leads The Right Place's international business development strategy. She conducts numerous foreign direct investment missions to Europe, Asia, and the Middle East each year, both independently and in collaboration with the state of Michigan and the governor's office. She is a frequent speaker on national and international economic development issues, having addressed audiences in France, England, Germany, Sweden, China, Australia, and Israel. She is involved in many local and statewide boards because she has a strong belief that communities' quality of life is just as important as the quality of commerce. In 2014, she was appointed by Governor Snyder to serve on the International Crossing Authority, a joint authority between the state of Michigan and Canada for the construction of the North American International Trade Crossing, the Gordie Howe Bridge. Close's economic development career began as an industrial consultant with the Berrien County Economic Development Corporation. She later served with the Michigan Department of Commerce and then Grand Valley State University, where she was an assistant director of the Office of Economic Development. She is a graduate of Western Michigan University, as well as a graduate of the Economic Development Institute, and completed the Economic Development Finance Program through the National Development Council, and has attended the Harvard Executive Management Training. Birgit is also the recipient of numerous awards, including, just to name a few, the Economic Club of Grand Rapids Business Person of the Year, Crane's 100 Most Influential Women in West Michigan, 50 Most Influential Wish Women in West Michigan, and most recently, she was inducted into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame. We also have with us Provo Provost Maria Cimitelle. Maria C. Cimitelle began her appointment as Provost and Executive Vice President of Academic Affairs and Student Affairs on July 1st, 2017. She is committed to collaborative leadership, shared governance, excellence in teaching, innovative scholarship, strategic planning, high impact learning experiences, and purposeful academic service to the community. As Chief Academic Officer, Provost Cimitelle 
is responsible for articulating the university's vision for academic distinction, the development and administration of academic and student affairs programs, creation of policies relating to instruction, curriculum, student life, and continuing education, facilitation of faculty and academic staff appointments and per performance assessments, and advancing scholarship and community service initiatives among faculty, to name just a few things. Dr. Cimitelli earned her PhD in philosophy from the University of Memphis, her master's from Villanova, and her bachelor's from the College of the Holy Cross. She joined Grand Valley State University in 1999 as assistant professor in philosophy, received early tenure and promotion in 2004, and her full professorship in 2016. Prior to her appointment as provost, Dr. Cimitelli served as associate dean for the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, as well as assistant and associate vice president for academic affairs in the office of the provost. We also have with us Lisa Postumus Lyons. Lisa was sworn in as Kent County's clerk and register of deeds in January of 2017. The clerk's office is responsible for three major functions of county government, managing all county elections, maintaining vital county records such as birth, death, marriage, and business registrations, and processing and maintaining all circuit court files. In Kent County, the clerk is also the register of deeds who records all documents pertaining to property in Kent County including deeds, mortgages, land contracts, liens, and other do documents pertaining to real estate. The clerk is also the clerk of the Board of Commissioners and statutorily serves on numerous county boards and commissions. Prior to her election as clerk and register of deeds, Lisa served as state representative for the 86th district, representing portions of Kent and Ionia County. A graduate of Michigan State University, Lisa is the director of before was the Director of uh, Public Policy and Community Outreach for the Grand Rapids Association of Realtors and the Commercial Alliance of Realtors prior to holding elected office. Finally, our facilitator and moderator this evening is Megan Saul. Megan was appointed to the Grand Valley State University Board of Trustees in 2015. On the board, she is the Chair of the Academic and Student Affairs Committee. In her full-time role, Megan serves as the Assistant City Manager for the City of Wyoming, Michigan. Megan is also a former engagement manager and project manager for CQL and a former business development manager at the right place. She has also worked in DC as a program manager for USAID and has extensive experience with local government and political campaigning. Megan is a dual graduate of Grand Valley State University, earning her bachelor's degree in international relations in 2007, her master's degree in public administration in 2009. We are also proud to note that Megan is an alumna of the Howenstein Center's Cook Leadership Academy. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. <laughs> Megan, I'll let you take it from here. All right, thank you, Chad. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's an honor and a privilege for us to be here, and we appreciate you all taking some time from your day. Um, as you've just heard from Chad's introductions, um, there's a wealth of knowledge and experience up here, so we are gonna jump right into the questions and not waste any time. Um, so the first question we're gonna start with, um, so the crowd can get to know you all a little bit better, is if you'd each tell us a little bit about how and why you became a leader. And Maria, why don't we start with you down at the sure. end there? Can you all hear me? Great. Um, I think I have two answers to that question. One is I fell into leadership, but I know that I was prepared when that fall happened. Um, I grew up in a family where you were really taught to speak up, and, and that was a valued very highly in my family. So I think all along I was ready um, to take a leadership position when it was offered to me. I was never scared about speaking up um, speaking my mind to my detriment many, many times. Sometimes I can't believe they even offered me these positions. So, um, <laughs> But I think when you're encouraged to feel confident in your vision, in your uh, perspective on life, and that you have a voice and that you should articulate those things, when somebody calls to serve on you, you're ready. So I would say that. Um, I did fall into leadership. I think... Um, I had a really good mentor who, when an opportunity came up, saw that I could speak up and so encouraged me to take a leadership position. I think that mentorship is really, really important. Someone that sees something in you that perhaps you don't see yourself and can encourage you. So I'll leave it at that to make room for other people. Sure, that's great. 
Lisa, how about you? Um, you know, I think Maria had a really good point in terms of falling into leadership versus setting out and I'm a leader. Um, I think leaders are made um, based on the skills and abilities that they're, that they're blessed with and um, in an area where they are serving. And that's what kind of happened to me. I, I just think a lot of leaders are shaped and honed as they step out and step up and choose to serve and serve their communities or um, causes that they're passionate about and just seek to make a difference. And as you, as you um, familiarize yourself with, with um, you know, your surroundings and, and what really needs to happen in whatever area you're serving at to make that better um, for people or for, um, you know, whatever the issue might be, you know, you're, you're constantly, even if you don't know it, you're constantly developing those abilities, but they're also channeled in a place where you're passionate about. And I think that's when, um, that's when leaders find themselves. So um, just, I've always been passionate about serving, about serving my community, my family, um, the people, and uh, mentorship was truly um, something that, that was invaluable and in helping you to be confident in who you're who you are and and to step out and kind of take a take a leap so that um, so that you can grow into a leader and um, help make a difference in your community Perfect. thanks one thank you um, for spending your time with us this afternoon I would echo a couple of the things that uh, both Lisa and uh, Maria said I didn't sit down one day at 17 or 18 and decided to be a leader um, I grew up with uh, a family, two parents who were um, who went through World War II, and were, my, had a very, very strong and outspoken mother, um, and um, and so I learned from observing her. And when I was in high school, my last year in high school, I was tapped to be the president of the student uh, body, and it was, that's not something that I. Uh, looked for, ran for, but the students in the leadership of the school came to me and said, would I, would I take this role and run for it? And I, I must have exuded something, but I took it. And, um, and the same thing happened to me. Um, I was a, in the dual apprentice system in Germany. And uh, in, in Germany, when you are in an apprentice program and you're in a large corporation, it is a requirement that the apprentice um, apprentices actually have a leader and a spokesperson. And I was chosen to be their spokesperson for all the apprentices in this very large corporation. So when I came to the United States, a uh, very different education system, I, I happened by sheer happenstance into the economic development business and fell in love with it because it gave me, like Lisa and Maria, the opportunity to serve. And eventually ended up here at Grand Valley and then the right place was created. And um, but. Somewhere along the line, I decided I wanted to really lead an economic development organization, not just be a number two or number three. And that was a conscious decision in my late 20s. And the reason being um, that if you are not the leader of an organization, your scenery never changes, if you think about that. Um, and so then I became very conscious about how would I create a career that would lead me to the job that I have today. It came much sooner than I anticipated. I too had an incredible mentor who was at one time the COO of Amway Corporation and the age of my dad. And he became a sort of like a second father to me and he encouraged me to go for this job because I didn't apply for it. I didn't think that 30 years ago a young woman in a very conservative Dutch community would ever get this position. And he encouraged me but he also encourage the board of the right place that I actually could do this job. Even though I wasn't from here, I had a funny accent, I was young, I was a woman, um, and I was ready. And um, I decided to take it when they offered it to me in 87 and just run, and I'm still doing that. That's excellent. So I think we've all just heard, um, certainly none of this came overnight, right? And I think we live in a society these days where we think everything's instantaneous and I wanna be a leader tomorrow and I wanna be a president tomorrow. Um, maybe give some helpful advice or hints about what things our students can be doing, individuals can be doing now 
to help sort of work themselves into positions or set them up or help them grow characteristics that might, um, might help them into leadership? Well, I'm happy to start. Um, you know, there's a metaphor, if you do any yoga at all, about trees and that trees are rooted so that you can bloom and blossom. And so I would encourage all the younger people here to be rooted, be rooted in your values, most importantly, and out of that, your passions will grow. Like Lisa was saying, that leadership is about passion. What are you passionate about? So at this point, I would say explore those things, explore as much as you can to find out what your passions are. And once you find that, put your roots down. And out of that, you'll, you'll find the place where you're meant to be. So. Get involved. Yeah. Um, pick, pick a... One thing I think a lot of people do that can hamper leadership is spread themselves too thin. Because we want to we want to change the world, right? And um, you know, you change the world by going gangbusters, but I think you also change the world by being strategic in um, in where you place your time and effort because you can't do it all. There's just not the time to be able to do that. So I would pick a couple things that, that spark your interest, drive your passion, and um, as you get involved, you're gonna meet people. You're just gonna, your paths are gonna cross and you're gonna have the opportunity to network with individuals who, who you may, down the line, um, work with in a, in a larger role. Um, you, know, you grow together as well. So I think a lot of it is, as you start now planning for leadership, get involved. Um, I would also say do everything you can to develop yourself personally and professionally. Um, those soft skills that a lot of employers are talking about. Um, employers are talking about these soft skills that are needed so bad. You know, communication, interpersonal communication, um, being on time, writing skills. It's not just because um, those make good employees, but that those skills also make good leaders. Um, and learning how to listen, developing your listening skills, and really seeking to understand and learn more about the area around you is, um, I think, is a really good uh, springboard to, to potential leadership down the line. And um, like I said, a lot of it is getting involved so that you can develop relationships, and, um, and those people will help you grow as well. I would echo, I would echo all of that. I would also say um, sometimes you, you I happened into economic development literally by happenstance. So be open to, you may have an education, I had an education in finance and I thought I was going to be a banker. And I came across this opportunity and I, I, I left myself open to that opportunity because I could apply my finance skills to a business situation, but what appealed to me in this job and why I do this job for 30 years now plus is today, tonight, someone is going to bed because they have a job, because of the work that we do. And that really is what drives me. So find out what drives you in a positive way and, and find that passion and then seek out other people who can support you in that. Um, find that mentor. Um, and I would definitely echo um, Lisa's comments. And that is, I said to my team, um, which is now over 30, we started off with three, um, it's not about your two thumbs. It's about your two ears. You, you, you don't just communicate with text. I'm sorry, I know we do it, but the soft skills of hearing, listening, digesting, communicating, it's a lot more than what we do today. And I think it's a lost art sometimes. But when you get into the work world, you have to, at the end of the day, you are, not go you are going to deal with another human being. In, in my job and in everybody's job here, it's about dealing with people. And yes, you can communicate in an email or whatever, but at the end of the day, nobody's going to locate in Grand Rapids via, um, via an email. They want to come here, they want to feel comfortable with the community, they want to feel comfortable with, with the people that they're dealing with. So remember that those soft skills, in addition to your technical knowledge, is really, really important. Great, thank you. So as we all know, this conference this weekend is about women and leadership. So um, we all know that women still um, aren't quite where we maybe like to be in the business world and um, when it comes to leadership. And so I want to talk really candidly um, with our panelists here. Tell us about some times when being a woman limited or challenged your leadership journey 
and how you dealt with those situations or maybe how you wish you had dealt with those. And um, Bergen, I might actually start with you. Um, Do we have two hours? For I was going to say, <laughs> uh, having had the benefit of working for you, I, I've heard some of the stories, and um, wow. you were certainly a pioneer in West Michigan when it came to women in leadership. So I um, would love for you to share. Well, you know, as I said a little, a little while ago, um, 30 years ago when, um, when this job became available, um, I deliberately did not apply for it uh, because I was very convinced that I would not um, get the position uh, because I was a young a woman very new to the community, um, and 30 years ago, um, Grand Rapids was um, mighty conservative. In fact, when I received um, the um, Business Leader of the Year Award here three months ago, I had a, I had an, a very nice note from a very well-known gentleman here in town, now retired, who said, when you took this job 30 years ago, this community was brutally chauvinistic. And you put your head down, you decided to uh, work your strategic plan, and, and do the job better than any man could have ever done. And I, he cried when I got that award. Because I, so there were hurdles like that, but, um, and they continue. I, I, a couple of years ago, a um, very well-known um, member of this community introduced me to a new uh, member of his team, a very, very well-renowned man. Uh, we had lunch and, um, uh, we had a chat and he was explained what I do and the leadership role I play in the community and he finally looked at me and said, well, you make just a great cheerleader. Whoa. And um, because the work that we do obviously is cheering on our community, but it's a lot more than that. And um, so I sat there and um, I was really annoyed or worse. <laughs> and, um, and I said, well, I'm really sorry, but I didn't bring my pom-poms today. You put the leader in cheerleader, is what you did. Uh, I said, you know, you can drop the cheer from the leader, um, and I forgot my pom-poms. And he looked at me totally sort of um, um, nonplussed that I would sort of object to this. And this is nothing against young folks who've done cheerleading before, but I, I was not, that was not what I was there for. So it continues, but you, you have to be situational in how you respond to this. Um, there are times when you have to really speak up, and then there are times when you just say, okay, I'll let it slide. It, it, it's, it depends. Governor Granholm earlier was talking about something similar. Um, sometimes you just have to bite your tongue, and sometimes you, you have to choose when to go to battle. And, um, and so that's, that's but it, it continues. Um, we are, we are, it's a journey. It's endurance. We're not there yet, so. Lisa, how about you and your time in the House? Um, I'm sure you probably encountered some interesting experiences, um, not quite as many females in the um, House of Representatives these days as we might like. Sure, yeah. You know, I think good leadership, above all, is imperative, um, whether, whether male or female. But at, at the same time, when you are making decisions on behalf of the people in the state, having a different perspective and different backgrounds is absolutely critical as well. And that's why I think it's really important that we, that we encourage women to step up and lead and take office. Um, yeah, I've experienced some challenges too. Um, when I was running for office, I, I'm a mom and I'm a wife. First and foremost, above all else, um, I'm a leader in my home and uh, I had four kids, all under the age of five, when I decided to run for office. And you should have seen the calendar I put together to be able to knock on doors for 10 hours a day, six days a week, and still spend time with my kids. But um, every family makes their choices in terms of what role each individual is going to play. And I didn't decide to run for office and then tell my husband, hey, I'll see you in six years. Uh, this was a decision we made as a family, and that was our family's decision, and that's what we thought was best for our family at the time because I felt called to serve. Um, I ran into, as a Republican woman running in a primary, I ran into several doors um, who, you know, they'd seen my picture, they'd seen all my kids, and slammed the door in my face after saying uh, a mother should be home with her children. 
Do you know who slammed the door in my face? Women. Women. Amen. Every time. And so I think I found that to be very interesting that, um, that when we're talking about in, chal meeting challenges in terms of uh, being a female leader, um, it doesn't come from just other, it doesn't come from men. It, comes fr it can come from everybody. And um, so I, th I thought that was a huge learning experience and eye-opening experience for me. Um, but you don't, you know, like, like Birgit said, you don't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with everybody. Um, they don't know, they don't know me. They don't know, you know, the road we took to get to this decision and you just move on because you're going to continue to make a difference. You know, when I was in the house, I, I wasn't exactly, um, you know, I'm, I'm in my, when I started, I, was, I had just turned 30. And so not only am I a female uh, serving in the house where there's just, um, you know, very little representation, I was also very young um, to boot. So it was a challenge to get people, you know, on committees or, or in, to, to vote for some of our issues and things like that. It was a challenge to get um, other legislators who didn't look or act or think a thing like me to be able to say, all right, I trust you. All right, I'll follow you. I'll follow your lead. That's challenging. And it's, um, you know, some of it, some of it's chauvinism. Some of it is just learning more about each other and coming to an understanding. Um, and that's where, that's where your skills and abilities come into play. You know, you can, you can overcome some of these challenges just by, just by proving yourself and, um, you know, showing results. And, and then when you've done that, it's a, you know, some of those challenges go away. But the biggest challenge I've faced in being a leader, and I don't think this is, I don't think this is unique to uh, women running for office. I think this is something that every, every individual goes through, and it's, a, it's been a personal challenge, and that is being able to serve and lead um, effectively um, while maintaining my priorities and being the wife and the mom that I want to be and that I need to be. And it's, nobody can answer that for you. Nobody can tell you exactly what that looks like because it looks different in every family. Um, but you have to know what your priorities are. And you have to know what kind of, what kind of, um, what you want to bring to each of your priorities. And that can be a challenge because every, the world's going to take everything you're willing to give it. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And nobody is going to be able, nobody's going to protect your priorities if you don't. So that's been a challenge. And, um, and it's one that you know, we, we all face. Yeah. That's great. Marianne? Well, I, what you said really resonated with me. Um, I come from a field, uh, you notice in the introduction, my d academic degrees are in philosophy. Most people don't realize that philosophy is very much like the STEM fields in terms of how many women are in philosophy. Only 18% of PhDs are women. It's the same as engineering. Um, so that's a very male-dominated um, field. I don't know why I was drawn to that, but <laughs> there I was in graduate school, which for those of you who are thinking about graduate school, it's a very exciting time. Uh, in philosophy, it's a very combative atmosphere. And philosophers like to think about arguments and then challenge each other on those arguments. So that was a very, actually, a good training ground for me. But because there were so many men there, I remember one story that, similar to your cheerleading story, I was a teaching assistant for a large class, and there were three teaching assistants. And I walked into the mail room, and there was the professor of record with the two other teaching assistants, both of whom were male, and then I came in and I said, well, what are you talking about? And they had been doing a spreadsheet with the grades. And, and uh, he said, oh, well, he was from the South. He said, honey, don't you worry, pray a little head about it. You know, and I thought, okay. And then there was that moment, am I gonna fight this battle? I, did, I chose not to, but I didn't forget it. Exactly. Okay. They didn't forget it. And so I think when you have those, and I've had other um, sexist experiences throughout my career, absolutely. Um, I still do to this day. Uh, people wonder if you're a woman, uh, can you be a leader? Are you strong enough? That what we were talking about earlier today, that 
a balancing act between being aggressive and being assertive, and, and everyone has to find their way through that, given that we do live in a culture that's inherently sexist and racist and homophobic, if I might say. Um, so how do you find that balance, and how do you navigate that? People's expectations of you, of you tend to be their projection upon you. And so just remember that. When those sexist things happen to you, if you're a female, it's not about you and you have to not personalize it. It's about the society we live in. And so you have to figure out for yourself how you're gonna navigate that. And, and we all have our tricks, I think. Um, sometimes you realize that um, you're gonna ignore it, but I, I'll tell, share another story with you. Um, one time when I didn't ignore it, and it was because it wasn't about me, it was because I knew I was gonna set an example for everyone in that room. And those are the battles that you wanna fight when you don't want to let somebody get away with saying something that diminishes your humanity in some way. So I think I'm on a soapbox, sorry. But, <laughs> but I think there are challenges that women face in the work world, in their careers, in their families, that you have to navigate that. But that's, again, where it's hel so helpful to have a mentor mm -hmm. or, or a friend. One of the things I, I forgot to mention, I was thinking about it after... Um, I said I was really prepared for leadership because I was taught to speak up, but then I went to a college that had a mission of men and women for others. And I met a really great group of female friends there that I'm friends with to this day, and they are my support network. And so when I have those, don't you, you know, worry your pretty little head over it, and I call them and we laugh, but then it's a commitment to one another that we know who each other are. And so it's grounding in those moments to have someone who can mirror who you know you are when everyone else is telling you something different. So, If I could just follow up on what Maria just said. Um, I am always, um, and I know Megan knows this, um, my staff constantly gets asked, what's it really like to work for Birgit? <laughs> um, and, and the underlying question is, she's got to be a real, starts with a B, right? <laughs> because I am very assertive. But if in a woman, when we are assertive, it's called aggressive, right? All of, we are then aggressive because I'm very authentic, I'm very German, and I always preface everything with, let me be my German self for a moment so they don't all get scared to death. But when a man is assertive, he's assertive, it's okay. But we are aggressive, they're assertive. There's just a fine difference. When a man does certain things, that's fine. When a woman does the same thing in the same way, not so much. Yeah. The other thing that I want to follow up on is what Lisa said, because we always are speaking of men as though they are the only ones who are discriminating against us. I have experienced um, women in this community who undercut other women because they are competing for the attention of the, of the very male-dominated society mm -hmm. we still live in. Mm -hmm. and that's a very unfortunate thing. Because when, when Lisa got elected as a young woman legislator, I cheered because there are not enough women legislators, right? I cheered when we had another provost as a woman here at Grand Valley, because it would be very easy to go out and find a, a not, a non, a no, somebody other than a woman, right? So, because I look at it as if they win, we all win. Yep. Because they set an example for the rest of us. They raised the bar for all of us. And so when you then run into your own gender and you feel that you're, having your, you're being cut off at the knees, that makes it even worse than if it happens from a man. Absolutely, yes. So when you go out there, support other women. It's, it's a win-win, make it a win-win because you don't want to walk away feeling like a loser. It's, it doesn't work. I think women bring something to the party that, that often is missed. We like to get to win-wins, at least I do. And I'll say just a quick note, um, I think for the men in the audience, we certainly appreciate that you're here. I had an experience recently um, with a male colleague, made a comment, and it was a sort of a slight against me. I don't think he meant it that way, but it came out that way, and there was another male in the room, and he witnessed it, um, and he didn't say anything, which is fine, but we got in the car afterwards, and, and I said, can you believe what he just said to me? And he goes, yeah, I didn't know what to do. And I said, well, and he goes, well, you know, sometimes I think... You know, for the feminists out there, they don't want a man to stick up and, and yeah. you know, help them. And I said, well, that's fine. I said, but understand that there are times when, because of my age or my position or otherwise, 
I can't say something, like politically or for whatever reason, I, I'm not able to, so that's then when you hope that someone else will, and whether it's a man in the room at that time who maybe has a position or authority, or maybe it's a phone call afterwards or something. Um, but it, in talking about how do you support women, you know, certainly we all need to be better supporting each other, but sometimes just having the appropriate response or following up with that friend um, is really what we need the men in our lives to be doing, I think. So um, sort of transitioning from this a little bit, um, and Marie, you just touched on this. Um, what, in your opinion, can be done to further advance equity and include the voices of those from marginalized communities, especially women of color and our LGBTQ colleagues? Sure. It's a little bit what, what you just said, Megan. Um, you know, there's a big difference between power and empowerment. And I view leadership as empower, empowering. You empower others. You empower others to get tasks done, the win-win. Like, so when we think about the fact that we do live in a racist culture um, and often we don't have diverse people around the table like what you were talking about, how do we, how do we change that? I, I guess I want to point out two things. It's one thing if I say to a woman of color, oh gosh, you're just like me, you belong at this table, come on here. That's, that's asserting my power. But if she says to me, Maria, I have this issue and I think you can help me. Can I have a seat at that table? My job is to get her the seat at the table if I'm in a position of power. It's not to speak for people. And I think that is a really important distinction that we have to keep in mind. Um, the difference between asserting one's own power because of a privilege of your race or gender or role, because lots of us are privileged in very many ways that others aren't, um, or inviting someone to the table to speak for themselves. Again, it's about that speaking up and just making room because when we do have that diverse table, like Lisa was saying, we're all much better for it. Um, I would say education, education, education. I think the number one thing that we can do to help make anybody and everybody successful is making sure that everybody, no matter where they live, what they're doing, um, what their social status is, what their economic status is, has access to a quality education so that, they're, so that they are set up and have the skills and the training um, to go out and meet, meet you know, the, the workforce. And, and, um, and I think that, first and foremost, is absolutely foundational. Uh, I also think, along the same lines as education, is just learning more about people who are different than you. Um, you know, it doesn't, make, doesn't mean you're going to always understand everything um, about somebody who um, is different from yourself, but it does mean that you are aware that not everybody looks or acts or feels, thinks like you, and that, um, that just a little bit of, of, of learning and, um, and uh, just being aware goes a long way. And I just, I think, I think at the, at the end of the day, when you have, you have people who are um, successfully educated, um, whether that's to go to college or whether that's to, you know, go into a trades, I think education is the foundation that sets people up for success. And then, you know, making sure that you're, again, um, learning from people who don't look, act, and think like you do. Um, and some of it, as you go out into that aspect, a lot of it's just changing hearts because, um, you know, of just a lack of understanding. And so communicating with each other to learn is a big, is a big um, way that we can set everybody up for success. I'm glad you asked the question because um, I, would, I would suggest that 10 years ago or even five years ago, to ask the question, not necessarily about the African American and other minority communities, but particularly the LGBTQ community, you would have never even asked this question. We would have shoved this issue under the rug, because it, it has been under the rug for so long. But it has come out over the last five or six years, right? We, mm -hmm. It is now um, a, a national law that, that, that community, that um, gay people can get married, et cetera. So to even have the question to me is at least a tiny little step in the right direction. Um, I'll give you an, an, ex an example um, that happened 
at the Right Place Board. And when the Elliott Larson Act, which unfortunately was not passed, but my board chair um, is the, um, the co-chair of the, um, the task force to get it passed. And we were asked at the Right Place Board to support that bill. And I have members of that community on my staff. And um, I had to take it to first a committee and then the executive committee. And I will tell you that the leader of this university played an unbelievable role in this issue because it, it was very, I was, I was um, concerned because I did not want my staff members um, to be hurt. And it was a huge surprise to me when that vote passed 35 to zip to support the Elliott Larson Act. That at least is a step in the right direction. Do we have a long way to go? I think we keep talking about inclusivity, we keep talking about equity, we talk about all of these things, but if we are not intentional about it every day, then we're gonna be talking about it in 20 years and this community is going to lose out on an awful lot of talent. And when, when, we, when we came to those votes, it, it was about talent um, because it, it shouldn't matter. Um, uh, to me, I want your heart and your mind in this community to make it a community that is inclusive. So we are not getting just the list of being the best economy in the country right now, but that we're also the best place for everybody to participate. Um, uh, but to me, it's more than, everybody talks about that it's about talent, and I understand that, and I don't want to lose another African-American or gay person to somewhere else because they don't feel welcome here. But we are all God's children. Right? Mm -hmm. um, if we believe that in this community, then we have better be very intentional how we include everybody. And it's not a power play, as Maria said, to say it, it has to be authentic. Um, it has to be authentic. That's great. So um, one last prepared question, and then we will be ready for all of yours. Um, along the lines of partnerships, um, in the best of situations, the three sectors that you all represent, public, academia, and business, would be working together to help nurture future leaders and create positive change in our communities. Have you seen effective partnerships or collaborations that you can share with us? And do you wish for some that aren't in place yet? And Lisa, why don't you start? Well, I, I think it's no secret that Grand Rapids and West Michigan, Kent County in general, has, has something very unique and special about it in terms of our collaboration with public and private partnerships. Um, and you see that branching out into not just, not just business and government, but business and government and our educational institutions, be it our, you know, our local public schools or, or our universities or our community colleges. Um, there's just a spirit of collaboration and um, all across the board. And that's really, that's really risen our economic, um, our economic vitality, uh, even, even as the rest, I mean, even during uh, an economic crisis that we had s several years ago. Um, and so it's not really a new concept to us, but you know, I think, the, I think there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of different groups that are doing exactly what we're talking about, and that is you know, working to develop future leaders and bringing out the potential um, in, in our next generation. And, and encouraging people to step up and lead and run for office, especially especially women. Um, but I, what I don't see is is a kind of a uh, not a, I don't want to say a clearinghouse, but a but a coordinated effort. I mean, you've got as far as it relates to running for office and being in the public um, public sector, there are a lot of a lot of groups that are working to develop that leadership, but very few um, you know very few are not necessarily tailored to develop leadership in general um, and foster that. They're more specifically, you know, this party and that party and and so which which they have their roles, don't get me wrong. Um, but but we we have we have um, the ones that are are doing a broader general um, leadership development, I think I think they do a really good job within themselves. Uh, but I think I think we could really do a better job um, working with more partners to make that um, to make that uh, that opportunity more available to people and just um, make more people more aware of it. That's great. 
Maria? Um, well, I guess I would say this. I, I agree with Lisa. Um, we have a unique place here in West Michigan. I don't know if everyone knows this, but Grand Valley was started by business leaders at the time. And so that we've always had this really interesting partnership between the public good as inclusive of economic development. Um, and so that's a really nice partnership that we continue to have to this day. And so I think those kind of initiatives, whatever, whatever specifics they are, really build our community in the way that we see has really, we're really lucky to be here in this type of environment. I don't know how many people realize that, in Grand Rapids, I mean, and the tri-county tri area that I call it. Um, but we're very lucky to have this kind of development where we all are working for the public good, whether it be a government entity or a, a corporate or a nonprofit entity, and then education. And I'll speak from, from the latter, obviously. We are so happy to have community partners to help us figure out what degrees to, should we offer and to provide the workforce for our region so it continues to be vibrant. Uh, we heard a story before about a place where there was, um, I think it was a steel factory, was that what it was, At, in Massachusetts uh, that went asunder and there are no jobs. We are so lucky not to have that, and it's because of these type of collaborations where we have a lot of different entities here in Grand Rapids, and we have a lot of talent, and to be part of that development of talent is very, very rewarding, especially, I'll just say personally, when so many of our students are the first in their families to attend college, we're opening new worlds for them, so. Well, I, I would agree that this is the community is great at public-private partnerships. Um, I think we could almost write the book on it. Um, where, where I think um, if we're talking about empowering women and, and not only just women that look like us, but women of color and women from the LGBT community, I, th I think we could be much more intentional um, ab about going about that. Uh, there, there is a lot of um, talk about it. I, I, I appreciate all the private-public partnerships. Obviously, I am one. I work for one. Um, it was founded by the business community the same way that 32 years ago as Grand Valley was. And we've come a long way. But, but when, when we make every grade list of we are number one, we're the number one economy in the country right now. We're the number two manufacturing economy. We are one of the best places to live. We're one of the best places to raise a family. But we are number two out of 53 where African Americans can, can be successful. We're missing something. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is, I think we need to be way more intentional on how do we get more lease alliance into the legislature. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean that sincerely, particularly when you look at term limits. Um, they ha have put this state into a very bad state, to be quite honest, because when she got to be her, at her best, she had to leave. When she got to be at her best, she had to leave. It would be like saying to a brain surgeon, you know, really know how to do brain surgery, now we want you to go away. Well, I would really prefer a brain surgeon who has about 20 years experience. So, so I think this community in this region could do way better on how to figure out um, a way of identifying um, leaders, uh, female leaders of any hue and shade who can serve in the legislature. Because I believe that women bring a unique perspective regardless if you're an R or a D, to the legislature. We look at things differently. Um, and we bring a leadership style that is different. And um, if you look at, 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 um, at our House and Senate, if you look at it in, in Washington, and then you look at the German parliament, not only do, does Germany have the most powerful woman in the world sitting at the top of the heap for 12 years and hopefully for another four, we, we can hardly get a, a female senator elected. Huh? We, that's very difficult. Uh, whether you're pro or con, we can't get a woman leader elected in this country. Uh, you had a woman leader in India, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in England, in England again, in Germany. What is it? What are they afraid of? Um, and so I think as a region, because we can't do it for the whole country, we should do a much better job in seeking out um, smart women leaders to see if they're interested in public office, because we really need it. Great. Well, hopefully we have some smart women leaders in this audience here who will feel empowered after all this. 
run to for represent office. us someday. It'll be great. So um, that being said, our prepared questions are all done, and you've all been very patient. So we're going to open up the microphones first for um, any students who are here and might want to ask a question. So feel free to come up to either of the mics and maybe give us your name and let us know what your question is. Hello. Um, I'm sure you can just hear me from here. My name is Megan D'Amico. I'm a fellow from the Cook Leadership Academy, and I just wanted to thank you so much for your insights and your stories and your passion to be pursued to everyone here. It's really, really inspiring. Um, my question is for you, Maria. Um, I am a senior here at Grand Valley, studying biomedical sciences and microbiology, and I'm going to get my PhD next fall. And I'm really scared, but I'm also really excited. So my question for you is, what were some of the things that you saw yourself grow in during that PhD, whether it be leadership skills or fighting against patriarchal males? <laughs> Thank you. Um, sure, I'm so excited for you. That's no kidding. Very exciting I'm time, and girl. yes, it's also a time when you're nervous. But but wow. you wouldn't be doing that if you didn't have a deep love of your discipline, and that will carry you through. So whenever you feel a little nervous about you know, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be with people I don't know, and those type of things. Your curiosity is gonna carry you through, and that's what will drive you during these years, and really that's what you should be focusing on, is getting as much knowledge as you possibly can. Um, and you're gonna be with other people who share that love, so that's tremendously exciting. Um, so if you do encounter some of the things like we were talking about, um, let's just call it the cheerleader example, because I just love that. <laughs> If you have a cheerleader moment, um, you just stay grounded in yourself and, and make sure that you do what you know is right in your heart. And if it's speaking up at that moment, it's speaking up at that moment. But I, I would encourage you to, to think about what, you're, what you say and what you do and how that reflects upon the world, that the envi small environment or larger environment that you're in. That will help you because leadership, if you're an introvert like I am, um, leadership can be really difficult, but if you think about, I'm not, this has nothing to do with me. This is about getting prepared, either I'm getting, preparing myself or I'm preparing others for something that's going to make a difference in the world, then it's easy. Then it's easy. That's great. Thank you. Another question. Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm a junior here at Grand Valley. Um, I have a question for whoever would like to answer. For those of us um, that are kind of up and coming as far as uh, leadership development and kind of training in that area, um, how would you go about initiating and fostering so as to get the most out of like a mentor relationship? So what, do you, what are like your main insights into um, building those relationships and finding the best way of growing through that? Thank you again. Real quick, it's, it's, you're doing it right now. <laughs> so you're ahead of the game. Um, Taking advantage of things like this, where you, where you build relationships with other people and and meet meet individuals who have, have you know been there, done that with their experience that you can call upon um, down the line. But I would also say too, um, as I mentioned, um, you know it was kind of one of one of your questions. How what should you be doing now? And that is just getting involved, um, and that's where you'll find people who, who have, um, who were like you before. And through experience, you can, you can take their knowledge um, as you've developed a relationship and, and really learn from them. Um, so it's really, about, it's really about doing exactly what you're doing right now and um, getting involved. And, and as you do, you find those experienced people. Um, and have the confidence to ask. I think a lot more mentors should open themselves up and take the initiative. But I can tell you this, I've never met somebody um, who was seasoned and experienced and had and had wisdom to to share and to pass along, that was offended by being approached by a hungry individual wanting to learn and lead and um, from that person's example. So just have the have that kind of have that confidence um, to to approach somebody if you if you find somebody that really moves you and inspires you. Well, I, I I'll add something to that. Um, I had an. He grew into my mentor, the gentleman I mentioned earlier, and I was very fortunate. I could always fall back on, even when he retired, um, we would get together regularly. I learned more about Grand Rapids over 80-year period than I could have ever learned in a history book. 
But the other thing that, that I could take advantage of, because I was a young person when I took this job, um, I learned from each one of my board members and chairs, um, not necessarily even by, um, by asking specific questions sometimes, but just by observing how they handled themselves in various situations. Um, when we would get together and I would bring them my work and how they dealt with issues, or if I ran into a, a problem, I would call them up and say, I'm facing this, how would you do this? And you, you begin to, to amalgamate that knowledge into your own style. Mm -hmm. And you take the best of, of uh, many of them. And I've had, um, obviously, over 30 years, quite a few board, board chairs. And you will have different people. And, and each one of them will bring something different to your party. And I, I'm, I'm not saying that you might have a board chair. But as you are getting to know people, observe how they deal with difficult situations mm -hmm. and never be afraid to ask. I mean, I have never met anybody, as Lisa said, who is not thrilled to be asked, particularly by a young person, um, how would you do this? Um, because people really do like to share what they, what they can. I mean, it's, somebody said this earlier, I think it was uh, Governor Granholm, don't be afraid to ask. I, I don't think I could add very much except almost everyone has time for a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. And, um, you know, just it's hard to ask sometimes, but I can't imagine saying no. Um, so, and I also have learned a lot just from watching other people. Sometimes what not to do. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You yeah, know, both. It's, yeah, it's, it's both. not either or. Yeah, it's both. Yeah. Yeah, if it's Saturday morning and you're at Meyer and you see one of these three ladies, don't ask them then. Just <laughs> send them an email or a phone call or something, but not, not at Meyer when we're in our weekend clothes. and you know, No makeup. Because yeah. that always yeah. happens. It does. Um, any other questions? We'll open it up to the whole audience as well, but um, feel free to come on down. Hello, um, my name is Sam Martin and I'm also a fellow in the Cook Leadership Academy. Um, my question is for all of you um, and whoever wants to answer. Um, I'm a second year grad student in the College Student Affairs Leadership Program and the main point of my graduate research is retention. Mm -hmm. So I know you mentioned earlier that um, education and having access to a good quality education is a way to elevate women and LGBT folks and people of color in our society. And I'm a firm believer in that and I agree with you with that. But my question for you is, what are we doing to keep those students, mm -hmm. right? So we have LGBT folks, people of color, and if you even wanna put that at the intersection, LGBT folks of color who we're losing. And we lose multiple populations of people with one student leaving. So my question for you, for all of you is, in academia, with the Board of Trustees and community partners, what can we be doing better to keep our students here? I'd say make sure there's jobs. I mean, it, we lose talent, when we lose jobs. And you know, it's very overarching, but, but, um, but that's the number one thing. When people, when we take the time to invest in young people um, and see, watch them learn and grow and, um, and really be, get a great education and then to watch their, their backsides as they're leaving you know, the state line, that's, it's crushing. Um, so uh, especially if they're leaving because they didn't have a job. I know we're never gonna keep everybody. We're not gonna be able to retain everybody because you know, some people wanna go to the mountains and you know, some people want, for whatever reason, like 100 degree and humidity. But um, so you know, there's a lot of it, aspects that we can't control, but we, we can control um, policies and creating an environment where, where there's economic growth. And we can control the kind of, um, just the kind of community we are, that people are drawn to with a quality of life and are you know, having, having park spaces and just things that people can do, you know, a, um, a vibrant, vibrant downtown. And um, I mean, that's, for me, I think that's the best way we can retain um, our educated young people. Make Kent County a place people wanna be. And when they have a job, and when we've got a great, you know, great community that they can belong to, I think they'll want to stay. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at this, because I face what you just asked every day. Um, because we are obviously the organization that creates those jobs that Lisa just referred to. 
And um, at an unemployment rate of 3.1%, there's lots of jobs out, out there. And I, I don't disagree with Lisa that it's, it's about jobs, but it's also about, um, and please don't take this word wrong, you, connecting people who don't look like Birgit Close um, to their tribe. Um, and we are having a very difficult time um, doing that in this community. Um, and, and there is a recognition in the corporate community that we are indeed having a hard time with this. Um, so I, I, we take, there is a very serious conversation happening in this community right now. Um, not overt, but, but how do we retain talent that is not looking like it used to 10 and 20 years ago? Because it's not just retaining students. We attract talent of color to this community, and often they leave. We, we, we try to attract talent of different colors, and often they won't even come because they don't see each other in Grand Rapids. And that is something that, yeah, you're nodding your head, I know. Um, uh, it's true. And, but, but we do have various pockets yes. of communities of color, and the question is, how do we connect everybody? And there are, there are very deep conversations going on because there's a, a growing frustration mm -hmm. in, the, in the community that we cannot, we have done extremely well here. Let's, let's, I mean, this community looks so different than it did 30 years ago, right? Um, the cultural offerings we have today are different, but there are groups like the Community Inclusion Group that, that you may want to check into that is very actively looking, I mean, that has for 10 years worked in how do we bring entertainment that appeals to a different audience than the normal symphony? And, and I'm a symphony member, so. How, but, but there is a real issue that we need to tackle. And you can call it inclusion or equity, and I don't like those words because they get overused, and then when they get overused, they get abused, mm -hmm. and then they don't mean anything anymore. What we have to do is be very intentional. And authentic, as you said. Authentic and authentic on how critical. do we connect and, and, and I, I'll be very honest with you, I had a conversation with um, um, a group of African-American leaders in this community. I said, look, you're here, we can't keep um, talent like yours. What do we do? And, and maybe it's not the white community who does it, but then who does it? Or we better do it together, because I don't really care if you're black, white, pink, or purpley polka dotted. Mm -hmm. I want your brain in this community. Because we're going to need, this is about the, the world that we're, ha that we're living in today. Your competition is not in Holland. It's in Harare, Pakistan, period. It's in this different place. They are having an education. They are, we are competing globally for who's in this audience. And it's fungible, and it's movable, and it can go anywhere they want. And if we don't recognize this, both as a country, a state, and a region, we are going to lose the competition for those jobs, because I can't fill them then. So we have to get, I'm, obviously you can tell I'm very passionate about this. This is one of those things that has been at the core of my being, and I'm trying to work very hard with others. I'm not the leader of this. I am a contributor to the conversation, but the conversation is happening in this community right now. How do we keep you from going to Chicago or Atlanta. That, that conversation is going on at a very deep level. And not only that, but when, when we bring somebody like you to this community, how do we connect you to other people so that you feel you have a community to belong to? Because you're new. You're, you're new, where do, where do you go? Where is your, where is your beauty parlor? Where is that community that you want to connect into, right? So that conversation is going on, and I'll, it, it, and that we have to make progress on it. I mean, I'm feeling ex it's it's a passion that I have that, that um, yeah, that I'm pushing very hard, very quietly, um, not so quietly anymore. <laughs> but but it, it it is a very 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 big deal. I mean, I've had a corporate person tell me that if they cannot, if they cannot. Um, attract design talent because it's, it's often from the LGBTQ community, he'll put his design center in a city where they are feeling comfortable. 
and I don't want to lose those jobs or those people. So, so it's that we are fighting today the number one location factor in today in any community, regardless of what planet you're living on, is talent, period. And if it doesn't, it, and and we need to be sure that we keep all of it. I hope that answers your question. Well, and I might say too, um, you know, I think it's really incumbent upon each of us to reach out to other individuals, mm -hmm. to see other people as humans and just meet them as humans. Mm -hmm. You know, as a board member, I can't make any of you be friends with any of the people that you go to school with, right? But um, as a couple of the folks here said, I think it is very much about community and your tribe. I always say to people, I could live in the middle of a cornfield if my friends were there. I'm not quite sure what we would do, but I would be fine because my friends were there. And you then, can come to my house. I am in the middle of a okay, cornfield. Okay, great. Going to Lisa's house. It's going to um, Lisa's house, exactly. But, you know, a lot of life is about who you're doing it with, right? And if you don't have to, people to do it with, then that's kind of terrible sometimes. Right. So, you know, who are you including in your life? Who are you choosing to make friends with? As Lisa referenced earlier, are you meeting people who come from different places that you do, who have different stories than yours? Um, are we being intentional about who we're inviting into our circles and whatnot? And it doesn't mean you have to invite everyone, um, but I grew up in West Michigan, and we all know there's a little bit of a bubble here from time to time. So are you getting out of that bubble? Are you learning about other people and cultures and things? Um, so I think it's on all of us as well, and I'll say that I'm included, right? Same here. Um, to make people feel welcome and to forge new relationships. So. And remember that person with an accent probably speaks one more language than you do. <laughs> <laughs> At least. Yeah. At least. Well, I'll, 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 I'll go. Um, I, I, I read an article about, um, just recently, about Angela Merkel, um, um, the, the Chancellor of Germany, um, and a uh, fascinating article, a fascinating woman. When she was coming up in, in the equivalent of the Republican Party in Germany, they called her the girl. And slowly but surely, the girl eliminated every competitor male um, and made it to Chancellor. And today they call her Mutti, and Mutti is the German equivalent to mom, or mumsy, and she takes it, and she doesn't care. And um, so she was asked what it took for her to be, she's a physicist, by the way, um, to be at her age, the chancellor now of the world's fourth largest economy, and she said, endurance. Endurance. And so we're, you, you're going to have to be really patient, but don't think the struggle is over, because it's not. Um, so endurance. Keep hanging in there. Keep following your goals. She made it. You can too. I guess I would just add, um, in closing, uh, we just need to see everybody and value everybody the way we want to be seen and the way we want to be valued. Um, not because of because we're all human beings. And if we're truly, the golden rule is so simple, but it would work if we all utilized it. Um, but despite that, it's, that's idealistic and it just isn't gonna happen and you're going to encounter challenges. You're going to encounter chauvinism. You're going to encounter setbacks. Um, whether they're blatant or just born out of ignorance, it can sting. But my, I mean, my parting words to you would be, um, don't take it personal. Remember what your goals are and, and keep focused so that, you can, so that you can be successful and don't let it make you bitter. Let it make you better for it. Amen. Yeah. yeah I was just gonna say, you know, if you're interested in being a leader, and I don't care what your title is, if you want to get something done, you have to be optimistic, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be optimistic and sometimes that's challenging you have to be optimistic and don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Just work through that fear, push through the fear, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And you have to just have that confidence in yourselves. And I guess I would just harken back to something that um, Maria said and just knowing your values and where you come from and um, sort of how you feel about yourself because 
it's very easy to let the world dictate how you feel about yourself and what you think your value is. Um, and I certainly don't believe our value comes from the world and what it says about us. So just, as Marie said, going deep and really taking time to figure out who am I, what am I about, what's important to me, and then being sure to hang on to that. I think that's really important. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, so four of you, very, very much for today. Leaders are everywhere, but in West Michigan, we are particularly fortunate. And I don't know for all of our young people here if you realize how as respected and admired these four women are in our community. And I'm so thrilled you got to hear them today and that you might get to meet them out here at our reception. CLA fellows, every student here, you can do this, and we are here for you on your leadership journey. This concludes our first wheelhouse talk of the year. Congratulations, Cook Leadership Academy fellows for our first time together since orientations. And, but, and thank you to every student who's here and everybody else who's here through the conference. It concludes this amazing conference as well. Our time together has been unique and energizing, a gathering of minds and spirits like we all can't believe. We're very grateful. And I really welcome all of you to join us on the last reception and the close of this fantastic weekend. Thank you again, everybody, and thank you all. <laughs>